Once again, you're listening to the voice of Free Arcadia. And we are so excited. Again, we're always excited here, but doubly so today because we're going to tackle a really fun subject. Um, but before we get into that too much, I uh, just want to say hello again, uh, firstly, to my trusty companion, uh, Chad. Chad, how are you doing today? Peachy King, how about you? I'm doing great. Uh, just excited to do more free Arcadia podcasts. This has been really gratifying. The response has been wonderful. And uh, thank you if you're watching on YouTube as well. We've been growing strong there, nearing 100 subs. So would be so happy if uh, if you're watching there. Go ahead and click that. And if you're watching the live on Facebook, again, really appreciate you. And again, uh, our very regular companion here, a regular expert on the panel, Julianne Peru, joining us once again. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. It's excellent to have uh, both of you here today to talk about Queen Emeraldus, or Emeraldus is her proper name. The Queen Emeraldus being the name of her infamous Zeppelin-shaped spaceship. And this character is so much more than just a mirrored version of Captain Harlock. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of inspirations there, and we want to get into that today. Where exactly Emeraldus comes from, that is the topic making the queen of the Liege Versa, in, in my eyes, in many eyes, you know, how she came to be, where she comes from, and how the character has developed over time. And I really just want to kick it right off to Julian here to get us started. He's outlined everything for us. His knowledge is so encyclopedic. Emeraldas is a part of this trio of space pirates that you find in a lot of Leiji Matsumoto's works. Uh, so there's Arlok, of course. Uh, there's his best friend, Toshiro. Uh, and then there's Emeraldas, uh, who is Toshiro's lover and Arlok, one of Arlok's closest friends. The first time we get to see uh, this kind of, of trio is actually uh, in uh, a manga, which was also very fundamental for Arlok and Toshiro, which was Gun Frontier. It was uh, published in the early uh, 1970s, uh, from 1972 to 1975. And you find there a trio of characters, Arlok, uh, Franklin Arlok Jr., Toshiro Oyama, uh, who is uh, the, the, actually the main character of Gun Frontier in many ways. Yes, yeah. and, absolutely. And you have, they are very quickly, they're already best friends and traveling companions at the beginning of the story. And very quickly, they are joined by a third character. She's not called Emeraldas. She's not quite Emeraldas yet in terms of personality and uh, she's called Shinunora. She's a mysterious woman, very sensual, very... Um, she's not afraid to use her charms, her body to get what she wants or gets her friends out of trouble. I, uh, I referred to her as the, the sultry subterfuge in the description, sort of the moving that the plot along and, and tripping up her teammates from time to time. Yeah, and, and she's actually, she's very much in line with the, the kind of female protagonist you would find in previous Matsumoto mangas, especially Sexaroid or uh, Mystery Eve, these kind of, of characters, which are heroes, but uh, charming heroes, basically, mm -hmm. heroes who don't not so much use violence or guns and so on to, to manage, but to manipulation, charm, sex. To, to progress so it's, it's very much a six late 60s 70s trope in a way it's not so much the femme fatale but the sexy female character the bond girl <laughs> in in some in, in a way emeraldas is not at all like that so shinunora is a precursor because she's the first time that you have this this complete trio of arlok tochiro and a female companion and in fact, she is in love uh, with Arlok, uh, or, or at least in a relationship with Arlok. And by the end of the manga, uh, the anime takes a, a different a different course. But in the manga, at the end, basically, you have Toshiro who decides to, to return to Japan. And, and Arlok and Shinunura are left behind. And Shinunura is expecting Arlok's baby. Or at least she claims it's Arlok's baby. So, so, <laughs> the, the manga left, leaves it a bit... A little because, ambiguity, yes. You're not really sure, but at least it seems like if if you consider that the Arlok of Gun Frontier is one of the ancestors 
of the, the, this line of Harlocks uh, through time, that would, I guess, make Shinonora uh, the, maybe the mother of the World War I Harlock uh, pilot, or, or maybe, I don't know. Yeah, and, and things in the anime definitely tend to lean uh, the other way. There is more of an implication that Totoro and Shinonora will end up being together. Um, and this perhaps is a decision by the studio to reflect the relationship of Totoro and Emeraldus that we'll see later on through different series. Uh, maybe you have more insight to this than I. Well, actually, the, in the anime, uh, they, they toned down the, the sexual part of it very much compared to the manga. And, sure. uh, and the only time we see Shinonora trying to sleep with one of the two main characters is actually with Arlok. Because Toshiro is supposed to be hanged at that moment, Arlok is not in the mood. And so, so it's, uh, <laughs> in the manga, you're saying that, yeah. No, no, in the anime, in the anime. Well, in the anime, from what I remember, Totoro and Harlock are both propositioned uh, at, simultaneously yeah, uh, a couple she, times. At uh, the beginning, she, she <laughs> offers them to do it together, all, all three of them. <laughs> a little and, menage a trois, yes. And, and when they don't seem interested, she say, oh, you, so you guys are together. It's okay. I'm, I'm a modern woman. So there's no problem. And they're like, no, no. Uh, so they, they can't stand the thought of looking at each other yeah. during. Uh, yeah, that, that is an issue for them. But I would say in the anime, Shinonora and Totoro have less of a sexual relationship, but a very strong, budding emotional relationship that to me comes off as very romantic yeah but the the, the anime uh has also uh, um tochiro having at some point meeting and falling in, in love with a woman called uh asaka i think uh yeah and, and they actually have a sexual encounter which is very That's strange true. because you have this sort of fish eye zooms on Tochiro's face during the, the act. So it's uh, <laughs> not at all what you would expect. But and then it's, it's really heartbroken because uh, spoiler alert, she dies. And, and it's yeah, a lot of the anime actually mourning her and saying she was the one she was the one I, I, I was waiting for. There will be no other. So you still have I could see that there could, you know, if there was a season two of Gun Frontier, I think it's not beyond the realm of thought that they would have shipped Shinonora and Totoro specifically because that is how they are in the in as in the Emeraldus form. That's how I see it, though. I, I could be wrong. I think the, the anime, because there's not this like Arlok's uh, child uh, leaves it more open in any case. Mm -hmm. it, it could go either way, I think. Why not both? Hey, she, she said before, I couldn't. That, that could be interesting. That would definitely tie into their uh, kind of link throughout time. Anything else about Gun Frontier? Chad, I know that you've read a good bit of uh, Gun Frontier and you've had opinions on it one way and the other. Like some of it is some like really solid intrigue writing and I really enjoy it. But other points in time, this is not really Emeraldus related, but slightly bits of extreme violence specifically aimed at women. And they'll be like naked, chained up to trees, entering a town like this, like, Oh, it's going to be that kind of manga. It's very interesting because uh, before Gun Frontier, um, Matsumoto did a, um, a Western manga, uh, which was an adaptation of an Italian movie. Um, so it's in Five Giants from Texas in, uh, in, in the English title. It's uh, the Five of the Vendetta, that's the, the international title of that movie. And it is even... I mean, Italian movies, Italian westerns tend to be uh, more crass than American westerns. They tend to mm. be more sensual. They, they, they tend to be uh, also more explicit in many ways. It's, it's not like it's not a clean far west. It's a dirty far west with uh, wide passions going on. Sure. I mean, it's already a, American Westerns are already a romanticized version of what the West was and taking out its most extreme portions. So when you bring it to, to where Rome and romance originates, it's going to be even further uh, sort of magnified there. Yeah. yeah. And, and so Matsumoto did the manga adaptation of that movie. And in that movie, uh, yes, uh, women get raped, women get whipped by the bad guys or the central female character who is uh, in, in the movie a very brave character because she's this mother who 
as uh, her husband is killed by the desperados, her child is kidnapped. Uh, she is outraged uh, in all the senses of the world. And she actually hires these five guys to avenge her husband and, and get and kill all those bastards, basically. And, and she's part of that journey. She goes with them uh, because uh, she wants to get her son back. You can see it's, it's you know, it's like a Ella Snow Fury, uh, like a woman's scorn, but that's mm-hmm. that taken to the max. And and I think that it's adap- doing the adaptation of that in manga, I think impacted the way Matsumoto conceived the Western, basically conceived the kind of story you tell in Western. And of course, Gun Frontier was also published in a adult, uh, more, more adult magazine. So there were expectations that there would be like sex and stuff like that in the story. Mm-hmm. So in French, we had a, an edition of Gun Frontier it translated. One thing I regret is that they did not include at the beginning a sort of preface or, or a sort of uh, introduction explaining the context of this manga and what came before mm-hmm. and, and the fact that it's almost a, a, a parody in a way, a dark uh, disturbing parody of the Western trope, of the macho Western tropes. Uh, but yeah, that's another topic. But uh, Gun Frontier is, in one way, it's very important in the career of Matsumoto and 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 what he introduced with Arlok, with Tochiro, and, and with Shinunora. And at the same time, it's a manga that if you just read it at the first degree, basically, uh, it's horrible. It's, it's it's a very bad taste story. So if you don't have the context and if you don't have the uh, the explanation of how you're supposed to read that stuff, uh, it's uh, it can be a very disturbing manga. Jarelle of Jury. T- tell me a bit about that. Basically, in the 70s, Matsumoto was starting to get a bit famous in the sci-fi community. It was before his big hits with Arlok, with Galaxy Express and so on. But he has done the character design for Yamato, which had put really put him on the map as the sci-fi mangaka. But but that was after Jarrell, right? Because I, I have here 73 and 74. I mean, there was uh, Lightspeed Esper. When did that come out? Lightspeed Esper was, if I recall correctly, was in, in 68. Okay, um, right. And at the same time, he was also doing a Sexoroid, which led to uh, other sci-fi stories like uh, Mystery Eve or uh, Machiners, a great early Matsumoto manga because it's it's very dark and it has this very oppressive, kind. it's a bit like Blade Runner, but uh, mm. if Matsumoto had done Blade Runner. Yeah, there's a lot of like sci- uh, dystopian sci-fi uh, city settings, urban settings there. Yeah. And and with Lightspeed Esper, that was really dramatic because uh, as we talked about last time, you start to see Matsumoto in reaction to doing this manga that features a character that's basically a ripoff of Astro Boy. He doesn't, he resists ripping off his friend and you see this new bold style emerge with these loose brush strokes and really revolutionizing the sci-fi genre just in yeah. style there. It, it was a, a moment where Matsumoto, Esper was a, a way for Matsumoto to jump into science fiction, basically, mm-hmm. to, to say, I can do that. And there's a lot of great stuff in Esper that and you can see that it's, for instance, it, uh, it had an impact on um, uh, Hideaki Anno, uh, some of the monsters that Esper fights really the design was basically the inspiration from so, for for some of the angels in Evangelion. Wow! Uh, and and so you can, I can imagine that Hideaki Anno was reading that when he was a kid. So he moves on from Lightspeed Esper, Sexeroid, and, and we have this as you have here, Jarel of Jory. A Japanese publisher is at the time, so it's uh, um, Ayakawa Shobo, uh, is publishing in Japanese some classics of. Western science fiction writers like uh, André Norton or um, Catherine Lucille Moore, uh, who is a, a very very important writer of the of the era, a bit forgotten I think today um, outside of the hardcore uh, sci-fi fans. But she actually she created a character uh, called, uh, and we talked about it I think in the Arlock podcast, a character called uh, Northwest Smith, who is really the prototype of the Han Solo kind of uh, space rogue <laughs> guy, a bit of smuggler, a bit of an adventurer, really a space cowboy in many ways. Charming, but tough, but with a sensible side. because Maybe a little bit more Solo, Han Solo than, than Harlock yeah, in some ways. But, yeah. uh, but she she's very famous for this character. And she also wrote another series 
which was Jirel of Joari, which is actually fantasy. Jirel is considered the first female protagonist in fantasy. It was written in the 1930s. So Jirel is a French warrior, or she, she, she rules basically the land of Joari, which is a, a domain somewhere in, in France. You don't really know where it is. It's, it's like fantastical France. And she's a woman. She's very tough. She rules this, this, this kingdom, this, I don't know, this duchy. And she has a bunch of adventures like Conan would. And there's always this sort of fantastical element with dark gods and strange crypts and stuff going on. It was published in Weird Tales, just like Conan was and, and Lovecraft. And yeah, it was it was done by uh, it was written by a woman. And and Jirel is, I mean, she's very strong. She's very cold, but she has all these very violent emotions inside her that she cannot show. To, to, to the outside world because she does not want to appear weak. And a lot of the stories are the conflict raging on within Jirel and how she manages her kingdom and fights her enemies. And, uh, and she's also a redhead. And uh, so in, uh, in, in 73, 74, uh, Ayakawa Shobo asks Matsumoto to illustrate both Northwest Smith and Jirel. He actually draws a, a lot of art for uh, for these two characters. I don't think it's a coincidence, basically, that one year after that, Emeraldas appears. I think mm. that illustrating, r- first reading probably for the first time, uh, the, the adventure of Jirel, to, in order to illustrate, I think he, he was actually, he, he liked this kind of character, which did not really exist in his work. At, to that point, you had, you had the mysterious kind of fairy women um, sure. Like, like metal, for instance, later became this kind of archetype of that. But that's an old archetype for Matsumoto. It appears very soon in his in his work. How would how would you describe the main character of Sexeroid? The main female character for, for, of Sexeroid. Um, Sexeroid for me is is the same category of Shinunora. She's a okay, sex, yeah, sexy, manipulative, but heroic character. Sure. So the little little bit of edge, the sexy edge, but with Emeraldus we have more of the and, and, just straight up warrior. Emeraldus is really a hero. She mm-hmm. is tough, but not devoid of emotions. You mm-hmm. you can see that she puts this very stern uh, exterior, but inside she's capable of love, and of course, and her love with Tochiro is. is is a is a big humanizing factor for Emeraldus, and and there's a lot in common between. Emerald as and Jirel, and you can you can really see that Matsumoto tried to do a kind of Jirel like character, but his own way. And uh, and and Max, Matsumoto works a lot with archetypes. You can see that you know you have Arlok as a space pirate, and you have Arlokish characters appear a lot in his work, and they yeah. kind of feel the same kind of role every time. You have the Tochio like character. You have the uh, the Tetsuro like character, and you can really the Doctor character. You can really see, even if they have different names, you can see they are kind kind of the same archetype every time. And Emeraldas yeah. is like bringing a brand new archetype into into his Ladyverse, and that's mm-hmm. a female hero warrior with a stern and and commanding kind of exterior. Um, yeah, indomitable, I believe was said there. So. Very, very strong character. That's very interesting. And so you say the ne- the next year after uh, publishing this Jirel of Jory, we have the Emeraldus one shot, which I am more familiar with. Uh, this diesel punk one shot, and it has uh, Emeraldus facing off against Captain Harlock in his very own diesel punk. Uh, is it called the Arcadia in that one shot? I'm not even no, sure if it's, it's named. Death Harlock. Death Harlock. Name okay, right. It's not the right. Death Shadow, right? But right. It's kind of in this kind We're of getting there. Mexico field. <laughs> yeah. It's in- it's interesting because it's uh, it revisits one of Matsumoto's very first manga, uh, which is a Bokenki uh, adventure chronicle the story, which was something he did when he was I don't know thirteen with uh, Captain Kingston, the pirate, and they are all fighting for a treasure map. It's really in the vein of of, of Tezuka's uh, uh, new, uh, Treasure Island. And he he, re- he reuses the, a lot of this in this Queen Emeraldas uh, one shot. And in fact, Arlok has a very similar costume to Captain Kingston from Book and Key. Uh, it's a white, actually white costume with a black uh, skull, something you would not you would not see again. And Matsumoto has this idea that is actually something uh, you you see again 
in, in a lot of his work in the 70s, this sort of cr the crew of men led by Arlock and the crew of women led by Emeraldas. And Emeraldas is actually yes. the hero in this story. Erlok is uh, the bad, not, not necessarily the bad guy, but he's a rival pirate who right. takes the map. Uh, or he has half of the map and she has the other half. Uh, and so, I mean, subtext. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need, uh, men and women need to come together to find the treasure. And at the end, you have the, I don't remember if it's the British or the Germans, or, but the bunch of enemy Zeppelin trying to, to destroy the pirates. And so they... It, it, it ends, uh, you know, it's a sort of Bolivian army ending. Uh, you have this ma massive fleet coming at them and they decide to put their difference aside and fight because they're all pirates. So they will fight uh, alongside each other against this, this common threat, basically. And it's interesting, their crews, Harlock's crew of primarily potato men, as, as they're called. And we have what you don't see a whole lot of other than with like grandmas in the in the Liegeverse, potato women. And these women are uh, it's really played up that th both of them are manning ships full of uggos, basically. <laughs> it's, it's a bit more um, actually in, in, in Emeraldas crew you see uh, a, a couple of key ku keys kind of type yes uh, as well but yeah it's women of all size and and uh, and shapes uh, and not there, there are some some better looking women for sure but there seem to be a lot of potato people running around but there's this very hilarious scene where uh, 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 one of Arlok's crew members who actually looks like it's a prototype of a guy who looks like Maji, so basically who looks like Matsumoto because right. that's really the Matsumoto standing basically in, in Arlok's crew opens the door on Emerald's ship because they've just boarded the ship and you've seen before Emerald's crew and as, as, as uh, Jake mentioned it's women not not all are beautiful women you have all kinds of women but the guy looks inside and the panel it's like shoujo perfect women with like sparkling stuff and the guy like <laughs> it's like he has, he's blinded because uh, probably that's the first woman he ever sees or something and uh, uh -huh. and to him they all appear like super beautiful women so that's that's very funny. And it, it's it, very equal opportunity in jabbing at uh, you know people who are unattractive. They're both sexes, and and by the end, the the crews are uh, fraternizing. They're they're yeah. getting together. They're hooking up a little bit there towards the end. And you can see also the side of Emeraldas, which is a bit more smile smiling, a bit more uh, cocky <laughs> in a way. Uh, that that later she will become a bit more serious and and stern. And She's a bit more of a swashbuckler yeah, in this. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A fun romp. Uh, I'm assuming that this was published in. Uh, oh, yes. This this one shot was published in a shoujo publication, Shoujo Princess, I believe. And that's something to note. Something I wanted to speak on about Emeraldus is that I firmly believe that she is a shoujo character. She had most of her tenure in shonen magazines, and maybe that's because a preconceived notion of publishers that, well, this is an action. This is, you know, swashbuckling sci-fi. This belongs in shonen. But I believe that Emeraldus is a shoujo hero through and through. Well, it's, it's actually, um, Matsumoto started his career doing shoujo manga. Yes. And one thing he, he complained about uh, at, at the time, uh, or one, one of the reasons he wanted to stop doing that, is that he, he had trouble uh, putting himself as a writer, as an artist, into the mind of a young girl character. Mm -hmm. That's why he preferred drawing animals whenever possible, uh, drawing Mikuns and, uh, and and these kind of stories. And, and probably... I think Matsumoto, when with the idea of Emeraldas, he said, ah, maybe now I have a female character I can write. That's my kind of character. So he was able to revisit this kind of publication uh, again. Yeah. And I don't know how much shoujo work he was doing by the mid 70s. This might be the maybe it's the magnum opus of his shoujo career is Queen Emeraldas. Um, between her her manga debut, her 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 own manga debut and this one shot, she makes her first uh, proper sci-fi appearance in Space Pirate, Captain Harlock. Uh, Harlock visiting 
the uh, secret base asteroid. Somebody shout it out if they remember the name. Uh, it's uh, Death Shadow Island. Death Shadow Island, yes. Uh, visiting Death Shadow Island, taking a bit of a, a break with the crew on this simulated beach and this Death Shadow Island being created by uh, Totoro Oyama. I believe they meet on the island and they see Queen Emerald or Emeraldus there and Harlock and them uh, go out to the beach and Harlock witnesses Emeraldus fully nude, uh, maybe echoing the uh, Shunanora aspect of what we remember about this, but in a stark and very shocking turn of events, Harlock pulls uh, his, I believe his gravity saber on uh, Emeraldus and shoots her down in, in the ocean as she's calling for him to join in, in this nude frolicking. And Harlock knows right away that this is an imposter because Emeraldus was loyal to his best friend. Totoro, even in, in death. Basically, it comes at the moment where the, the Amazons, so the, the alien invaders, uh, are, are trying to find what Arlok's uh, weakness so he is. And uh, and they completely misread the situation on this one. And they yeah. make the assumption that even today, um, you talk to people about Emeraldas and say, oh yeah, Arlok's girlfriend. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> so. You see it you see it a lot in the fan art sometimes too, the the shipping, as they say, of Harlock and Emeraldus and ship whoever you want. It really doesn't matter. It's all fictional characters, but dang it, this is Totoro Totoro's my dude. Totoro is, is fighting for all the little uh, you know, the, the people that don't feel pristine out there. We want that it it may be shallow to say, but it, it is a sort of a, a Liege insert in the manga world of him maybe not having the best self image and getting the tall, beautiful woman. And so, yeah, so the Amazon, they made the assumptions that they found out, we, we don't have the detail in the story, but somehow they found out about Emeraldas being Arlok's close friend. And they say, ah, okay, that, that's our weakness. That's, that's our win. <laughs> and they send this sort of uh, clone or, 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 or imposter looking like Emeraldas to seduce Arlok. It backfires very spectacularly, but it's important in the in the Lagiverse, basically, because that's where the, the Matsumoto introduced the fact that Emeraldas was Tochiro's love, and they were faithful to each other, and they, and they were a strong couple, which Arlok, for not a single moment, he actually believes this could be Emeraldas coming to uh, to to sleep with him uh, yeah no, it's a guy not... they call it guy code i think sometimes you know you don't you don't hook up with your best friends lady you know unless maybe there's an express thing there and it is interesting you know we have this kind of lasting if there ever was some shinonora in there in in leiji matsumoto's head the sultry seductress part is sort of shot down deftly there in the imagery and it's also uh kind of a trope i don't know how often he uses this but the hero just instantly knowing that that it's an imposter and shooting it down we will see that again happen yeah. Alec um, is very good at this <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know how often he used that in his manga the the sort of instant knowledge that this is a fake and, and killing it i don't know are there a lot of other examples of that happening before this um, in uh matsumoto's work i, I know in, in the anime it happens quite a few Okay, times. so maybe this is one of the first times that he uses that in his stories, and but, then he will repeat it again and again. That, you know, uh, a friendship and, and, and the, the, their relationships were so strong and so pure, right away you know something is wrong because none, the three of them would never betray each other like that. It's almost an odd appearance come to think of it because it's this Emeraldus character that we don't really have any background for. Why, why do you, we think it even shows she even shows up here and why wouldn't the reader just be like, who is this? Uh, I think my, my suspicion is that because the actual Queen Emeraldus manga series was starting a couple of months later and Matsumoto of course knew that so he's okay. basically teasing his other series. Like, and you want to know more? Uh, Check my other series. So Where, Was this running simultaneously? Because it's not like, I don't think it's issue one that she appears. I think it's probably like 
three, four, somewhere in there. So, I mean, I don't know how frequently these issues were released, if it was monthly or if it was weekly. I'm not I'm not completely sure, but I think uh, there's definitely uh, was was a lot, some overlap. Uh, sure. So, so maybe it's possible that issue came out after the Emeraldus manga started. Yeah. So that's that's quite possible, actually. We're we're talking enough about it. Let's dive right into the manga series. That's a, that, that's a big one, basically. That's the yeah. main source of Emeraldus lore. <laughs> sure. Uh, that's the, the the Queen Emerald series. In some ways, a, a frustrating read because Emeraldus is more of a supporting character. Uh, here, uh, in mm. many of the stories, sometimes she has a spotlight, but it's it's really Hiroshi's uh, stories. It's this a young guy who wants to live alone and build his own ship and and joins the Arlock Club <laughs> of, of yeah, of it's people. You, you know what I said this in in the last episode, but I believe that Harlock works best as this kind of figure that you look up to in the series and you live the series best through the child antagonist and we have this happening in uh the galaxy express 39 movie and right after that comes out we have harlock winning uh anima animagi's uh, character of the year award or you know i think it was biannual he won he he was very popular right after that and it had been a, a lot kind of a few years coming to get to that point and i feel like Emeraldus is now is taking that that position even before Harlock does, because in the Harlock manga, sure, Daiba is sort of a main character and you do have some back and forth between them. But it's a lot more exacerbated that Emeraldus is this far off thing that you look up to rather than always the focus. But we do get some good Emeraldus focused issues, she, but, but not right away. Yes. In, the, in the early stories, it's re, basically it's always Hiroshi try to build a ship, almost gets mm -hmm. himself killed. Mm -hmm. Emeraldas comes, saves his ass, scolds him a little bit, tells him, gives him some life lessons. Like if you want to live like us, do not try this kind of thing again, or you will just get yourself killed. You you get the feeling that when you know the rest of the Ladyverse, uh, you 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 realize that she sees in Hiroshi. A lot of what she she saw in Tochiro, uh, he reminds her of Tochiro, and so so she decides basically to to make her best so he doesn't die and gets to live his dream and uh, and and uh, and becomes the kind of man uh, he wants to be. But her motivations? Why is Emerald doing all of that? Is she following him? Uh, is she just here by accident? She does not really have a an arc for herself. At first, leader by leader, you have some bigger stories uh, where she gets to uh, with a siren and stuff like that, where, where she has a stronger role and she she actually has some uh, some some backstory uh, with with the enemies she faces and so on. For for me, it's it's a point where Matsumoto is basically almost the same vein as Galaxy Express, young guy, older woman, being a kind of guide through space. But he's trying a different approach. I mean, even in Sexeroid, that's happening, though, right? I mean, this yeah. is a strong archetype that he'd been playing with for about a decade at that point. In Sexeroid, the main character is an adult man. Yeah. Oh, it's an adult. Okay, he looks very young to me because I, I haven't been able to read it. It's not in English. It's, a, it's, it's basically he's a, he's a secret agent. Uh, he's already a guy. He's in the 20-something guy, a bit of a slacker. So, so he's a young adult there and then sort of aging down to make characters more, perhaps to make these main characters more relatable to children. Yeah. And and, For, and in Six Hour as the name implies, uh, the Shima, the main character, gets on, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, with, with, with uh, Yuki number seven. They have a, a very physical relationship. To, to yes, it's an. It was published in adult publication, so it makes perfect sense. You you see the complete evolution to where you get from Sexeroid to Galaxy Express, and and Emeraldus and Space Pirate uh, Space Pirate Captain Harlock are both integral in in that shift to finally reaching that point. Yeah, and uh, and but the manga 
establishes what will be Emeralda's personality from now on, basically. Uh, she's strong, she's a bit cold, but she's fair. She will help you. She, she, she might uh, scold you a little bit and, and, uh, and threaten to kill you herself if you're really dumb, but, uh, <laughs> but she's not that cold. Uh, she, in, in many ways, she feels a bit more uh, relatable than Arlok. Arlok is basically, uh, do your own thing if you get killed, I don't, if you get killed, I don't really care. Uh, but if you don't, then we'll be best friends. Huh? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a bit of Arlok's way of, of, of uh, handling Daiba. <laughs> and, and, and it's a lot more live and let live, even with enemies sometimes. Yeah. Whereas Emeraldus is uh, the main plot point, which is fairly early on, so not too big of a spoiler. Her scar being the remnant of an altercation where she let somebody live. Uh, that was attacking her and in a moment of that sort of what, what ends up being portrayed as weakness in this anime very specifically she she takes a scar and then has to uh take out her enemy and this is a lesson passed on to uh yeah. the young boy I, i'm not sure if i would call emeralda a mother figure in in this manga mm -hmm. because she's a little bit distant and not very warm uh, toward him but more of an she, aunt, she, maybe. She, she's trying to be a teacher, basically. She's trying to. Mm. She, she is actively saying, "I will learn. I will teach you how to survive in space uh, if you let me." Basically, she is very similar to Arlok in many ways. Of course, uh, she she may feel like a, a what we call a distaff counterpart to to Arlok, but. She has her own personality. She she's not like a copy paste of Arlok. She has her own way of dealing with stuff, and it also establishes that she has no crew aboard her ship. She she travels alone in this giant zeppelin, and uh, and it establishes that uh, she was in love with Tochiro. Uh, it, it it's hinted a lot in early on, but you have at the end you have a few chapters that really talks about how she met Arlok and Tochiro for the first time and. Uh, some scenes that would be uh, shown in anime in various versions uh, in, in um, Arcadia of My Youth, in uh, Cosmo Warrior Zero, you have some retelling of these scenes from a different, uh, different perspectives, basically, or different contexts. And so you, yeah, you get, in the end, you get actually quite a bit of backstory for Emeraldas. It's just that for a manga named Queen Emeraldas, you would expect her to be more of a driving force to the plot when in fact she's really more of a supporting character at least in the beginning yeah and and like i said i i, I think there's a beautiful taste to that i i like that i like not having this overpowered i mean she's op like harlock's op emeraldus is op when they become the main character you lose a bit of threat you know, and, and yeah. she's not always called in at the last minute. Some most of the time she is, but there's always room for this fallible character to kind of get in a sticky wicket and then work their way out. And another interesting point you mentioned there, this is the titular character, the Queen Emeraldus. Emeraldus isn't even the titular character, technically, because the ship itself has the name Queen Emeraldus, which it would be a common mistake for most people, and myself included. I quite often slip up and say, you know, Harlock, Totoro, and Queen Emeraldus, and then somebody like Julian says, ah, but wait, uh, that's not that's not her name. And talking about the ship itself, uh, in contrast to the Arcadia, they both seem to have wills of their own. Uh, the will of the Arcadia is a lot more sh shrouded in the beginning of of the manga. And I would liken it to a ghost ship. I believe that's a lot of the inspiration for the Arcadia is of a ghost ship, whereas the Emer the Queen Emeraldus works much more as sort of its own living program character. It's more of a it's more well known to be an artificial intelligence. It's not the transference of a soul, but that does kind of there is a soul still in it, maybe from its previous owner. Uh, the, it's a little bit more vague even in, the, in Queen Emerald. The story of the ship is different from one manga to the next. In many ways, it's very, it's a much more mysterious ship than the Arcadia. Arcadia, Absolutely. you know, it was built by Tochiro. 
in various contexts. <laughs> yeah. But there's always this sort of common uh, backstory. In Queen Emeralda, she found it. It's older. It was waiting for her. Right. Or something. <laughs> so it's, uh, Yeah, it was manned by this beautiful woman that uh, is completely mysterious. Maybe is the, the carving at the front, uh, the, the female sort of, I don't know what you call those. The figurehead, I think it's yeah, called yeah. in the manga. Chad, what, what do you think about the manga? Honestly, I, I think it's a little heavy in the inking. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, in contrast to Space Pirate Captain Harlock? Yeah. Because there's a lot more like characters with like blonde hair. There's a lot more characters that aren't so shrouded, hooded, etc. And mm. I don't know. I think that there was less of an encouragement to throw dials everywhere. A little less Liege meter uh, heavy than yeah. than the Arcadia. Interesting point. Interesting point. Yeah. And it's I think, since there's it's basically Hiroshi, Emeralda. There's no crew. There's no these recurring. Funny characters that you would see in in Arlok, like the Doctor or, or so on. So you have less scenes aboard the ship when when leaving happens. There's a lot less density in the shots as well because when you know you have a a, a crew of forty. You know Harlock and his forty thieves, so to speak, man the Arcadia. Where yeah, it is just Emeraldus aboard the Queen Emeraldus, occasionally with a male suitor or or uh, student, so to speak. And even uh, Hiroshi's ship is unmanned typically or if he's on somebody else's ship i think one of the first ships he hops on is this mineral transport vehicle and there's only room for there's literally too much weight on this vessel because of this little boy and the captain is saying oh we're not gonna make it so we're gonna kill you and throw you overboard and that begins the first altercation of this this young male character that he has to deal with. There's just there's just like a hundred more pounds on this ship than we can handle. And actually, we, we'll talk. I think uh, maybe and there's a bit, three people on it. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, a bit more in uh, later when when they did the anime, the OVAs of of Queen Emeraldas, they reused a lot from the manga. Yes, but they really did some work to flesh out some supporting characters, make the the, the People from the first ship being characters that become friends and and mentors to Hiroshi uh, instead of being just hostile to him. And and so the world feels more fleshed out in the OVA, even if it's in only four episodes in total. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely get into that, but it is a little bit more lived in. And and the heavy inking that, that Chad referenced there, I think, is a result of just not as many characters, which is very interesting. Maybe that was very tactile of Matsumoto there, that uh, he, he didn't want to have to draw like as many characters as he was drawing in uh, Space Pirate Captain Harlock and producing two mangas side by side. And who knows? I don't know what else he was doing at that point. I, I'm quite sure there were other one shots and other publications going on. So um, yeah, well, he, he, he was producing a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Quick note, so something I wanted to add, add very quickly uh, at the same time. So I think as a merchandising, basically for the manga, um, there were these dramas which were released. So, so it's funny because it's, it's Emerald Dust and not Emerald right. Dust. It, it's uh, reminiscent of Herlock. Right. Yeah. We have Harlock and Herlock. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, we even with Chochiro, we have Toshiro sometimes. It's uh, but basically uh, for Toshiro. It's actually Toshiro with an S. Is that's his real name? And Toshiro with a C is his nickname. Strange. We got to save that for a whole. To we got to do a Toshiro episode now. I'm just <laughs> well, realizing, of like, have. of course, yes. And so I'm yeah, looking the, forward to that. Stay the, tuned. There were two, basically, two uh, Emeraldus. And uh, and so yeah, and, and it's basically it's a drama. So you have some very nice ambient music. Uh, I think it was done by um, uh, Seiji Okuama, who, who did the music for Captain Harlock, the, the TV series. So that, that's really you have music and and you have uh, voice voice actors doing a story mm -hmm. with Emeraldas encountering some bad guys. Uh, saying Watashiwa Emeraldas a lot, <laughs> and uh, and and yeah, and I'm not exactly sure what the story is to be honest, but uh, yeah. it's interesting to see that at the time, the character was 
uh, popular enough to to have two drama uh, discs basically released with with more stories about her. It's interesting. It went to radio drama, and and we'll talk about anime in a bit here. I, I'll let us. I want us to get to uh, the next stage here. Uh, moving on to uh, a series of episodes within the Space Pirate Captain Harlock anime, yeah. in which the the story of Harlock, Totoro, and Emeraldus is fully fleshed out and fully realized and animated. I, I think it, it's just fully realized for the first time by yeah. Rintaro. It's, you have these, these two episodes, very late actually in the story, mm -hmm. uh, in the anime. Uh, I think it's at the moment where uh, Mayu, we know is Toshiro's daughter, but we don't really know at that point who the mother is. Uh, and we don't, and there's no, the scene with Emeraldas, uh, the Emeraldas impostor uh, you have in the manga does not happen in the anime. Mayu gets kidnapped by the Mazon and they're taking her to the other side of space, basically, to try to keep Arlok as far as possible from Earth as, as they can. And the, the crew is saying, why are we spending all this energy going after this little girl when we could defend Earth? And so Arlok has basically has to tell them <laughs> the, the story. So you have mm. two episodes that explain Arlok and Toshiro. Mm. Uh, they meet in the same way they do in the Queen Emeraldas manga. Uh, and they meet Emerald but she has a completely different character design than we used to. She's more of a co-girl with a, a hat and a knife on her. Uh, so, so it's not quite the Emerald as we know. I don't. I'm not sure why they gave, they gave her this very different design. We see her and Tochiro falling in love, and we see her, them having a daughter, and 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 it provides a very fishy explanation of why Emerald basically does not take care of her daughter or like she has to follow Tochiro's body in space um yeah it's a little a like, odd that's uh, okay that's strange yeah it's not quite it, it's it's it in one side it plays to the loyalty aspect of the character and in another side it plays against the uh free will of that character and i and one thing i wanted to mention with the manga that i forgot to mention was that it's almost like the Harlock and Emeraldus manga could be happening in the same timeline at the same time, even. I mean, is I don't know how outside the realm of thought that is because Earth is mentioned, but only in passing. You never really see the Earth in the manga from what I remember. So so it's it's like if that was what Emeraldus was doing later on, it would make sense that, well, she's on the hunt for something uh afterwards and would give her a little more purpose to go hunt something else but rintaro seems to kind of cop out a little bit yeah you know they, they, have, they, they do the backstory but at some point they have to explain why mayu ends up on earth being raised in an orphanage and it's like they're like uh premier all those leaves <laughs> she's she's done i mean they could have given her other you know i've got to go defend the universe or you know give her something else there there's a lot left to be questioned like of course mm -hmm. like the background um you don't really get to see her do a lot of like combat which is weird for that characteristic because she is very like competent i mean yeah you see later on she does very like precise shots with both like her dragoon and her gravity saber and it's just like i don't know why that wasn't thrown in in the anime She's just there for her face, essentially. Rin Rintar really rushes this part, and it's some parts of it are, are well done, uh, but it's mostly the the dude friendship between Harlock and Totoro. Their their thing together is wonderfully fleshed out. You know, the episode where they they become prisoners and they escape. Uh, does Emeraldus help them escape? I think they, they they manage to take control of the. Um, the, I think it's called the Everest, which is this big cruiser ship that that's uh, overing uh, over the, the 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 prison planet, preventing anybody from escaping. And Emeraldas is coming to free the the rest of the prisoners, right? Basically, and she she doesn't know she she, she doesn't know uh, on or, or, or she's seen them in in a tavern before, I think. But 
Yeah. She's not, they're not all fully acquainted at this yeah. point yet. And, and, and then she, and, and she's ready for a battle basically, but the Everest has been captured by these two guys who, who pulled the, the in deploy basically. And then, <laughs> uh, and manage that it's two of them to take control of the ship. And Emerald is like, you, you two guys, you two did that. <laughs> and and Arlok, who, who is really like the, the bro, uh, the, the wingman here and says, Oh, I've done nothing. He did all the work, and and, and, <laughs> and, oh, and that's the beginning of the love story, basically. Yeah, yeah, and then so we get in more so in the next episode where we don't get so much of the deft battling of Emeraldus, but we see her in a leadership position yeah. in the next episode. And so in the first uh, part, she's more she is going to fight. But from the safety of the ship. But yeah, she's not really displaying her her martial skills yeah. so much. I believe she almost comes into a confrontation one on one with the force that is threatening the planet that Totoro and Emeraldus inhabit. But I don't know if they come to arms. I don't remember that altercation. No, I, I don't think so, well. because they have Mayu, basically. And uh... right it's, it's come at a very bad time for, for she, she's going to sacrifice herself. Basically, I believe, because Totoro is still working on the Arcadia, I believe. And she's she's basically throwing herself on on the, the sword there to to preserve his dream. So, again, not a very uh, independent, but a very loyal and very strong, at least, uh, presentation there that she's she's willing to take the bullet for her man. We get aboard space train now yes the three nine the galaxy express and emeraldus has i believe it's just one episode here i believe so but, yeah but it is expanded upon yeah yeah this episode becomes a long longer form a, a movie it's sort of like a made for tv were these made for tv movies i be fair to say um, for the 999 like before we get the proper rintaro display full full animation i think that i'm not i'm not sure of what i'm saying so maybe i'm wrong but at the time to a uh, every year there was a sort of animation festival where they would do like long version uh of, of popular episodes that's how you get the mystery of the arcadia uh, movie right for for Arlock. and i think that uh, they probably did this sort of tv special versions of of uh, of these storylines uh, mm -hmm. as part of this an anime Matsuri uh, thing, I, I that's what I believe. But I'm, maybe I'm completely of the of the mark. Some of these series they would make something special or move a particular episode to a hotter time on the schedule and display them there to try and get people to watch it back when it regularly aired. So maybe something like that happening, just speculating. Basically, the Galaxy Express encounters the Queen Emeraldas, which has a crew of robots, female-looking robots, basically. And there's Emeraldas herself, but she, I think she wants Metal's body or something, like everyone does. <laughs> and, One way or another, and uh, and and Metal immediately knows that that's wrong because she knows Emeraldas, and Emeraldas will not do that. And and indeed, it's not the real Emeraldas; it's a robot who took her appearance and took control of the ship. So really, you have a, it's a, it's the storyline mostly from the Captain Arlock's manga without mm -hmm. the sed seduction part, but. Yeah, just that one little concept, really, completely yeah. blown out and distorted. Uh, and and they, we see they did not do it in the Captain Arlock series, but say eh, actually, yeah. maybe we can use that in Galaxy Express. I don't know. Maybe and, that's. And I don't believe uh, we we don't have a note here. So uh, I'm assuming that Emeraldus does not appear in the three nine manga as well as harlock so this is another machination of the anime to get these other liege verse characters in there emeraldas seems to be suffering from some kind of illness we don't know if it's fatal or just a um, basically a, a short-term uh, thing that's allowed robots to take over our ship but it established the idea that metal and emeraldas know each other i've met before and they know each each other well enough 
that metal is immediately able to know that no, that's that's not the emerald that I know. They don't really appear to be friend, more like uh, they respect between each other, but sure. uh, the, the, notable galactic figures. Yeah, the, the relationship is not really uh, fleshed out that much. It's it's notable because metal meets emeraldas for the first time and yeah it will become a big deal the pieces are coming together you know we know the the liege verse as this very cohesive thing where there's metal emeraldas harlock totoro these are the pillars of the liege verse but that wasn't the case until really the 80s and even going into the 90s and early 2000s when uh, we we have what we know today is those pillars together. Uh, Chad, what are your thoughts on this episode? Have you seen this uh, made for TV movie, so to speak? As I recall, the like robots, didn't they look a lot like, uh, what's her name? The crystal maid aboard the Galaxy Express. The... Transparent glass, uh, yeah. Claire. Yeah, I I do believe I remember them looking a bit faceless, a bit uh, nondescript. So it, it's quite possible, and that was the theme of uh, Galaxy Express again. These sort of uh, soul removed but soul implanted robot uh, bodies that were to be, you know, they were kind of the the fodder. What I don't know what they were called. What are they called in Sentai? with these like foot foot soldier type characters. I, I feel like they have a name, the putties or whatever they yeah, were in Power Rangers. Putties and Power Rangers, but yeah, I forgot the Sentai alliteration. But one thing that's interesting is that uh, the, the, this story with Emeraldas is a reversal of what we see usually in Galaxy Express, meaning it's not like a human became a machine and, and, and lost humanity. It's a crew of robots were never human to begin with. Okay, and yeah. Actually, try to steal a human's life, not in the sense of killing them, but actually stealing the identity and become human uh, or try to. So, uh, so it's actually an interesting twist on the. Yeah, and then we, you know, coupling that with Maytel's non you know human human body but not her human body transplant sort of deal it, it gets very murky and very uh chalk it up to the verse fantasy um and another note is uh i forgot to mention this 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 deft killing of the imposter happens in the emeraldus manga as well to hiroshi at one point where Emeraldus notices this ain't this ain't the boy I know and just blast it right away. So uh, this this becoming a very regularly used thing, I mean, three times within three years. So uh, less than it seems uh, two years, maybe. So yeah, Matsumoto yeah. and his tropes. <laughs> yeah, he loves it. Why not? Uh, but maybe actually kind of signifying the the beginning of a decline, maybe maybe not injecting enough new tropes in. We're talking about the 3-9 TV series, but now let's talk about the 3-9 movie, which go check out our uh, full breakdown, our intense, almost three hour breakdown <laughs> of uh, I'm looking at the timer now. I don't want us to get too late of Galaxy Express. Bonjour, Galaxy Express, as it was called in a, in a few places. Not I do. We will get to that. Uh, she does play a bigger role here. She, she does. And, and Matsumoto, actually, um, or, or Rintaro or Toei, I don't know who came up with the idea of bringing together basically the various works that Matsumoto was known for. So you take Galaxy Express as a sort of main storyline, but you, you bring Arlok, you bring Emeraldas, you make them stronger, bigger parts of the narrative. And you had Tochiro with a subplot with Tochiro transferring his mind into the Arcadia's computer and so on. It's, it's a bit, it's a, the Galaxy Express movie, I, I think part of the reason why it was so popular and, and why it's so great even today, it's a moment, it's it's like an Avengers Endgame, you know, it's a moment yeah. where all these little things come together for one epic movie. <laughs> Yeah, and you get to be the the antagonist, uh, the the protagonist running around, and oh, here's Maytel, she's going to be with me. But now here's Harlock. Oh, here's Totoro. Oh, here's Emeraldus, and just bumping, and not in that order. I believe Emeraldus is the first. Yeah, you know? 
Yeah, the first uh, sort of inkling that we'll have that we're going to run into a lot of galactic figures of note um, in the Liege verse. Once again, you see that Emeraldas and Metal know each other. It's a bit warmer than it was in the TV series with uh, Emeraldas, I think, says to, to Tetsuro, take good care of Metal. Uh, so you see that there's some affection there. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing I always found very interesting is that in this final battle, when an Arlok and Emeraldas comes to the to the rescue, basically to to fight the Prometheum's planet, Arlok is being very uh, swashbuckling, smiling on the helm of the Arcadia outside the Arcadia, yeah. um, and and you have a a shot of Emeraldas like destroying the planet with this face of very almost sadistic look. Oh yeah, a smile, and you see, like she's really enjoying destroying all this stuff. <laughs> and I don't know what was the idea at this moment behind the scene. Maybe like, okay, she lost Tochiro, so she's very angry, and so she's really enjoying this. Yeah, but it, you know, watching it with the the, the background we get from later works, uh, you could see that as see, this is personal for her, and she's mm. taking great joy fighting Prometheus for reasons. We'll, get to very quick very soon <laughs> yeah i mean chad you have your own theories about uh, harlock's state of mind during that battle right i mean i think to a degree he likes just to embrace the bravado of swashbuckling so he can just kind of really like get at the helm like i think to a degree he is sadistic but also he also uh it's all about thrills. That's pretty much what he lives for. Well, he may be doing a bit of swerving in the Arcadia, if you know what I mean. You, yeah, he may I, be a little tipsy behind the wheels. What you say? I, I <laughs> <laughs> you, maybe you're projecting a little bit there, but uh, it's not uh, atypical for Harlock to have a glass of wine uh, while he's doing that. Um, yeah. And Emeraldus sips a bit herself, but maybe she's a little bit more drunk with just pure rage, pure, unadulterated female rage. And this particular, a lover scorn is, I think, what I mean to say mostly there. Yeah. To a degree, I could also see that, you know, they're kind of ridding the galaxy of a very imposing and terrible thing. Yeah. So it's like bringing a close to it is nice for them. Yeah. This is very cathartic for them, for sure. Yeah. And an inkling here is is seemingly, uh, I believe you might have said it, Julianne, but Lieji Matsumoto might have gotten the inkling here in seeing Emeraldus and Maytel interacting after uh, Tadashi fires on the Emeraldus, uh, the Queen Emeraldus, and seeing their warm interaction might have sparked the idea for them to be later canonically sisters. Yeah, I, I think that's... Really, the moment where a lot of things of the Ladyverse come into place, as you said, uh, you have you had these little like bricks, and, mm -hmm. and the Galaxy Express movie is the opportunity to put all these bricks together. And I think even Matsumoto sees them come together. And say, huh, I haven't thought <laughs> of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely working out. And, and it's Rintaro paying a little bit more respect to the character, I think, in this instance yeah. than than he had previously. So it, it's good to see him mature in his expression of these characters. And, and this is probably the penultimate expression of his career. Um, so, like I said, we did a very long review on this movie. Please go check that out. Um, but 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 let's let's keep moving this thing along here. And the next appearance that we have, which this is completely obscured to English audiences, her appearance in in Queen Melania. We're going to have to lean on you really hard for this one, Julia. Yeah. So Queen Melania uh, is a, a manga that Matsumoto does right after uh, Galaxy Express, or he's still, I think, doing Galaxy Express as a manga, but. Uh, it's uh, he, he's done with Arlok at this point. He's done with the Emerald series. He, he, he's starting something new, but he's mm. still, I think, in this Galaxy Express universe, and he wants to expand that. And so he decides to tell a story which quickly reveals itself as being a prequel to the Galaxy Express universe. Uh, and the main character who on Earth is known as Yayo Yukino is actually very quickly referred to by her. Uh, uh, she's coming from planet Lametal, and, and on Lametal, her name is La Andromeda Prometheum. Uh, and, and of course, Galaxy Express 
readers and uh, and uh, and people who saw the movie <laughs> and immediately know what this name is uh, because she's indeed the character who, who will be become the evil queen of Galaxy Express and the mother of Metal. Promethean. And in, in Queen Millennia, you have, at the beginning, you have a mysterious antagonist uh, called the, the Millennial Thief, uh, which seems to be opposing Yayoi or plans or Ametal and the very ambiguous situation. At some point, it's revealed as a millennial thief, the leader of the millennial thief, which is a guy in a trench coat with a um, masked face. He's actually a woman, and it's actually uh, Yayoi's sister, Selene, or Selene, I'm not sure what uh, pronunciation is supposed to be. And uh, and Selene is, looks very similar to Yayoi, but she has, or she will have in the anime version, uh, auburn kind of reddish hair. Mm-hmm. And in the manga, especially in the later stages of the story, when there are these huge space battles and so on, she gets wounded and she gets a scar. Uh, and and at that point, you're like, yeah, okay, I know this character. And yeah. so for me, that's really the moment when Matsumoto decides in in 1980, say, oh, and by the way, because history repeats and the same characters basically reincarnate uh, over time and so on. So you have Yayoi and her sister Selene, and you have Metal and her sister Emeraldas, who uh, will have similar roles, with Yayoi being uh, originally seen as a um, collaborator, basically, of, 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 of the bad guys, furthering the plans of Lametal. But you realize that she's more complex than that. She is actually trying to take a third option there, and, and she has her own plans to try to solve the situation. Her sister is directly opposing Lametal. She is a, a rebel. She is a, uh, she, she's an outlaw. She has a pirate crew. And, uh, and the sisters are not, at first, uh, allies. They, they don't trust each other. But little by little, they realize that actually their goals are aligned, even if their methods are different. And ultimately, uh, they work together to, to defeat the, the real threat of the story. Yeah, there's there's the female warrior character and then there's the more feminine side. And these are different expressions of these female characters that uh, first oppose, but then and have tense situations, but then find their common ground. And it's very interesting to me that, you know, one year, I believe it's one year after this manga comes out, the Queen Melania anime comes out. Yeah. Right. And to me, it's. I believe this is a misstep purely because Queen Emeraldus was set to be that next anime, in my opinion. But instead, throwing out this new, lighter female, not necessarily helpless, but a lot more light touch. Um, Whereas, why wouldn't the studio make the obvious decision of picking up this popular Emeraldus character and giving her her own time to shine as an anime. And I almost wonder, were they thinking the world's not ready for Emeraldus uh, animated yet? What, what what was going on? I mean, do either of you have speculation on this? I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that Queen Millennia now is often considered the manga. I mean, probably Matsumoto's masterpiece. Com- contrary to many of his stories, this one has a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> it's not too long. It's not too short. He has a lot of great stuff. He has a lot of ideas. Some crazy stuff happens in this in this manga. You can see that he was really inspired by this story. Okay. So so at the time, I think uh, people really responded to that, and uh, and and Galaxy Express was very popular. Now you have the prequel story. So hey. Let's do that. Um, yeah. But at the same time, the TV series suffered a lot. They tried to do a whole series while Matsumoto was basically one third into his manga. And, uh, and it's a bit like Full Metal Alchemist, uh, the first anime series of Full Metal Alchemist, where at some point they just have to write their own stuff for the TV series. Mm. And that's where the the anime, I love Queen Millennia as a TV series. It has a lot of great moments, great atmosphere, great soundtrack and so on. But there's only so much you can do with, oh my God, 
Ram et al is coming and it will collide with Earth and it will be the end of the world. And it takes 40 episodes to get there. Uh, where in the manga, one third in, we are past that. And the real story is on the rails. <laughs> yeah, and maybe maybe they could have put in some more filler there. You know, they they did that with uh, Dragon Ball and things like that. They're waiting for for new things to come out. But even then, it, it your your knowledge of Queen Millennia and what it meant to people at that time definitely puts more insight. And in it's not just okay. Well, the world doesn't want a strong female lead that kicks ass uh, in their anime, but. It also plays into my logic where we have a complete Emeraldus story, or at least relatively complete. We don't need another 100. Maybe maybe that's another you know mindset issue of the studio where, wow, we got we got 100 episodes out of this Galaxy Express thing. Let's let's see if we can get another 100 out of this. Whereas if they would have just moved back to another short, complete 50 episode series, uh, with Queen Emeraldus there, we could have had a, a magnificent anime done and then move right into Queen Melania after that. Uh, but hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. And I think at the time, Toei was also already preparing uh, Waga Seishun no Arcadia, so uh, Arcadia of oh, Mayos. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so for them, the bringing back Harlock, who was voted as the most popular character sure. and so on, was more uh, higher Pressing. on the priority list, and but I again I guess that Queen Melania spot still could have been the Queen Emeralda spot. So I would love yeah. a Queen Emeralda's anime. I will, I'm all for yeah. it, <laughs> and we'll get to what what little she has in a bit because it's very good. But you have an interesting note here, uh, Masella, if I'm yeah. pronouncing that correctly. The Haldort no novellas. Um, this was happening simultaneous with Queen Melania. So we have Matsumoto writing uh, books alongside the manga. Yeah, but basically uh, it's it's in the kind of light novel format, short novels published in magazines put together as a one volume. And Matsumoto, I don't know how it came to be, to be honest, but he decides to try it, to write some stuff instead of just of course, he illustrates it as well, but mm -hmm. tries to write a story. And for some reason, uh, he, he, he doesn't use Arlok. Maybe it's a right question. Maybe at the yeah, time... Yeah, who publishes it at that time? I believe it was... Sh did Shogakukan have those rights at that time for uh, Harlock? I'm not sure, uh, but maybe, you know, because there's a second Galaxy Express movie being production and so on... Mm -hmm. Maybe he's not completely free to use Harlock in that context. Yeah. I, I, who has I, the print rights to Harlock at that point? It's yeah, and who publishes those novellas? I, I don't know. So, so he decides to dance a bit around the issue. Yeah, he have a very Harlockish character who has a ship named the Death Shadow and has a, a black flag with a skull and crossbone uh, uh, emblem, and he's called Aldart. It's Aldart, the, war, the space warrior, basically. And Aldart uh, fights villains called the Illumidas. That, that's where they come from. And he has two best friends who join him in his travels. Uh, one is Toshiro Oyama, because apparently Toshiro was okay to use. And the other one is a very tough and, and brave female warrior called Mesala. Or, or Missela. I'm not, it's it's right. a bit of a dyslexic Melissa, it seems. I don't know if it was a, an intentional degradation of that word or just a random speculation there. And uh, and so the three of them fight against the Illumidas and blah, blah, blah. And, and it, actually, these, these novellas bring a lot of the foundation for Arcadia of my youth. Uh, getting our flag and fighting for freedom and then fighting the Illumidas and blah blah blah, and and uh, and what's funny is that a few years later, I think I think in 1983, so after Arcadia of My Youth was released in the cinema and there were Mugen Kido SSX and so on, these novellas were reprinted with a new title, which was weirdly Gun Frontier Two. And in this reprinting, uh, uh, Aldart becomes Arlok and, and Mesela becomes Emeraldas because, I mean, 
it was obvious. But uh, yeah, in the first version of these stories, it's Aldart and Messala. Interesting. Yeah. And I have no context. I, you, you've read more of that than I, and, uh, all we can do is assume it's got a little bit of a uh, gun frontier vibe in it, maybe, but, or maybe not at all. It's more so, uh, Arcadia in my youth, which we could probably move quickly right along to, because this one, uh, a little bit more to unpack probably for all of us. Yeah. Uh, Arcadia of my youth is a, is a f- film that. Since there's no there's no other Arlock manga uh, available, I mean Matsumoto only did the one uh, which was already made into a TV series. Toei, uh, the writers from Toei, decide to take stuff from other works where Arlock, either Arlock himself or Arlockish characters appear, such as the the cockpit. Yeah, the, the which where we get cockpit. the entire intro to. Yeah, absolutely, and the flashback in World War II and, and so on. Uh, they take Aldart, plot points from Aldart, and uh, Illumidas as the antagonist. Yeah, and they build a story with that. Like in the Aldart novelas, the Emeraldas has a strong uh, role to play in that story where, where she has a, she, she's a bit different from what we know of of some other work like she's a sort of smuggler or neutral uh, yeah ship is used to transport stuff but not not for battle sure i mean uh chad can you tell us a bit about emeraldus in arcadia of my youth and and how she's presented she's kind of like an intermediary between different plot points um it's focused mainly on getting from what was it uh which time period was that? Was that World War II? Yeah, I believe the the cutaway to Harlock and Totoro. Yeah, you know, them running away from the Nazi forces after they were trying to get away to Switzerland. And she was basically kind of like a way to, I guess, camouflage their escape. <laughs> right. I mean, the Illumidas are a galactic threat. They are imposing their will on many different civilizations at this point. But Emeraldus appears in the story as a neutral third party. Is that what you're saying, Chad? I mean, because that's interesting because Switzerland being maybe a more neutral party there, that Tarlock and Totoro meet Emeraldus as a neutral third party that will welcome them when they need some firepower at this point. Is that kind of where you were going? Yeah. That's interesting. I never made that connection at all. So now I've gone from I'm so fucking lost to I understand now. That's actually really brilliant. Had you put that together, Julian? Uh, no, actually, I never really. Uh, but indeed, uh, Emeralda's appearing and right away saying, like, I am. I take no side. I'm neutral. The mm-hmm. connection with Switzerland uh, and trying to reach Switzerland is actually a very, very smart connection to make. That's I never made fucking it. brilliant. Okay, <laughs> Emeraldus is Switzerland, um, and but she comes in. She's got firepower. Her ship is damaged, which is an issue. Uh, she's taken some licks on uh, the the Stanley, which uh, I can't even think of it right now. What is it? Um, is the Oh, it's seven corridors of fire, or I don't know how it's called, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, why are we all dropping this? It is kind of a little, the, 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 the Stanley, Stanley Witch Mountains. Stanley Witch Mountain, the Stanley of Mountains of Space, which anyways, yes, she's, she's taken a bit of a lick there, but she seems to have gotten out of it because she doesn't really have too much life force on her ship, which uh, we'll, we'll see later. She, it's not as manned, literally. And figuratively, yeah. um, you have a plot hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it makes more sense. Is she she came close, but then there was there was too much life on the Arcadia later. Um, and yeah, then I think I think they mentioned that she's actually transporting refugees. Uh, ah. that, that's what she's doing. Actually, she's not taking side in the war, but she's she's moving refugees, and that's what that's what the Illumidas later use uh, as a as an excuse to arrest her, basically. Mm. Really fascinating there. And then throughout the rest of the movie, uh, she's a very important character. Uh, She falls victim to being held prisoner by the Illumidos with Maya. And she's we see her providing this sort of sisterly emotional support 
at one point where Maya is at her her most her saddest, but maybe her deepest. She feels a lot of regret at this point because they're using both Emeraldus and Maya as uh, hostages, as sort of. You want this? We're 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 going to kill this. So they they're baiting uh Harlock out much like they baited Harlock with Mayu in the anime. Yeah. Um and it's a moment where Emeraldas or this version of Emeraldas which so far had been like I'm neutral, I don't take side, uh, this is not my war basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a moment where she shows the steel she has inside her as she she talks back uh, to the the Illumidas commander, and she says she says something like, uh, uh, "You you think yourself brave warriors? Well, uh, we we two women will will show you what true courage is." Uh, and it's really a moment that's very like, ooh, goosebumps, you know. <laughs> and and Emeraldus, you know, for being neutral, you know, a lot of people in war would would look down on the ability to be neutral, but she still is motivated by uh, good forces, and her neutrality allows her to move. She's a licensed free space trader, and that license gives her the ability to move throughout the universe. And there is the, at one point when they think to to maybe use the Queen Emeraldus on their mission against the Illumidas, it would cost her that ability to move freely, which becomes a sort of sticking point throughout the rest. There, there are several moments where Emeraldus is willing to give up her ability to move freely to fight for this cause, but alternative methods of fighting prevail maintaining that sort of necessity to she's so closely attached to the cause but ultimately must have space and also if we keep in mind that maybe already at this point matsumoto has decided that emeraldas is not from earth that she's from Ramital, and she so basically what's happening to earth you you can understand that she may feel that Okay, that's, that's that's not my problem. <laughs> Basically, that that's the Earthlings deal with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not taking side in your war. Not my planet. You know, maybe it's already a hint of that here. Yeah, yeah. She's 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 growing as a character. A lot of great character development in this for her. Probably more so than any other animated depiction that we have. So moving right along from the movie Arcadia, Me- My Youth to Endless Orbit. SSX, where uh, I'm not sure how many episodes she's featured in. She's not in every episode. Not that many. uh, Maybe five or six, something like that. But we do get to see her in more roles than we have seen before. I mean, uh, Chad noted beforehand that we hadn't really seen Emeraldus, who in the manga is quite able to handle herself in in a martial confrontation. She's robbed of that ability, even in the Arcadia My Youth movie, where she's basically crucified. And and you see a little bit of Emeraldus titty in that, too. If you're if you're looking real close, you freeze that frame. You see a little bit of that. Um, I think that's the only time we ever. See, well, no, no, no. You see she's like full nude in the manga. Never mind. But uh, in the space, uh, that's a robot. That's true. That's not technically her. So the first time we get a little bit of uh, anyways, she she's like crucified. She's not she doesn't have a lot of uh, what I want to say autonomy. And in this, she has more than she's ever had before. What, what I think very interesting is that um, before the TV series came out, actually, there was a pilot uh, movie which was actually Matsumoto for what we know was very involved in, in this one it oh. was called um, Kaizoku Kikan Arcadia so it's Arcadia uh, the pirate ship uh, and, and that's that's what Matsumoto apparently wanted to make as a TV series as a follow up to Arcadia of My Youth and if you watch this pilot and it's it's on it's on my website my website so this is right the online. full pilot on your website is this yeah. but is this uh subbed in french no 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 there's no subs no subs at all just animation a, you just have like uh Arlok saying stuff uh like mm, freedom yeah. and, <laughs> and and you have la- lots of images uh showing you the tone they were going for and uh and it's a completely different thing that that what endless orbit as you call it and you see it's much more gun frontier ish there is more, much more uh, alien races and, and and strange things, and apparently the Mazones were in there as well. I, I'm not sure, but it looks like it looks that way. 
and you and you can see Emeraldas in in the pilot, and you see a scene where she's like having a beer with Tochiro and Arlok in a tavern, and so it seems like she would have been really a part of of the adventure instead of these characters they meet once in a while uh, over yeah. the course of twenty six episodes. But of course, we'll never know. But it's in, it's interesting to see, and and that's a moment where Matsumoto became a bit yeah, disillusioned with, with animation. Yeah, uh, because I think at, uh, he felt like it was not really his ideas anymore that were put on screen, and 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 his voice was not listened to anymore or not enough. And of course, uh, what's interesting in in Endless Orbit uh, in the series we did get uh, is that they tried to make it a very close uh, the, the, there's episodes near the end where you see actually Tochiro's getting sick his love story with Emeraldas blossoming basically and 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 you see him dying and and they actually redo without Tetsuro from Galaxy Express but they redo the same shots yeah. of him going to the wreck of the death shadow and parallel between the, the two and and Emeraldus, like I said, she is given her martial autonomy. She she definitely handles. Uh, n- no, she she is uh, sort of upset through this fencing battle with an Illumidos commander, where somebody's uh, trying to take a, a wry shot at her from shoot her in the back, basically one of the subordinates. But uh, Harlock is out there looking out for Emeraldus and ensuring that she can fight this battle one on one. And and she is. Uh, th- there are some. Harry moments in there, but she manages to come out on top and uh, dispensing of her foe. And and this uh, this may be the first occurrence of her uh, throwing out roses where she's, uh, you know, R.I.P. homie, uh, just kind of throwing a rose on on her foe there. This this love story that you're talking about, which is so important, is the most fleshed out. SSX, in my opinion, is the story of Totoro. It is the gospel story of the Liegeverse, where we have the Jesus-like figure living out his life uh, through the end of days and making ultimate sacrifices for the greater good and living forever once again. Uh, so th- th- I don't know if Re- Matsumoto ever read the Bible. I don't know. <laughs> it is in a way a very Christian story. Uh, yeah. And and even at the end when they meet uh, the survivors of the, of the trip, meet the, the, the goddess, uh, the, the golden goddess, who has the ultimate power. And, and ultimately, Arlok is the one who is able to show forgiveness and, and show that he, he, he can actually renounce violence whereas dr zone who become who is a kind of evil tochiro in mm-hmm. a way because he's a guy who builds ships as well uh, so he's more right he's more a rival to tochiro than to Arlok. absolutely he, he's like an evil tochiro who wants to be Arlok. That's, yeah, that's very interesting. And, and we see yeah we see zero fighting against harlock primarily but at the end of the day, I think you're absolutely right. That that that's the parallel. That's the Bizarro version of Totoro. If he was yeah. tall, dark, and handsome instead of uh, short and uh, goofy, but I love short and goofy boy. Th- this may be a little. This is very speculative. But uh, when Totoro and Emeraldus. Uh, have their first meeting and and he does go not the first meeting but their first uh, extended encounter so to speak really their only extended encounter uh they spend some time on the spaceship together and when they depart emeraldus gives totoro a rose not this time in slaying but this time in a very gift-like manner and to me i might be reading into this a lot a lot a lot but it seems like this is symbolic of what had transpired on the Queen Emeraldus and perhaps Emeraldus giving, if not her virginity, her lover status to Totoro as a man well, and woman. The, the, the rose is a very romantic flower. Mm-hmm. Uh, and let's not, not even go into like deflowering. Uh, that, that's what I get. It seems very on the head to me. But, but, but. but it's also, it's also um, a reminder of Maya and Arlok because Maya also has a rose as a symbol of her love for Arlok. Mm-hmm. So it's also a reminder, I think, of that. Yes. Uh, basically, Tochiro has found his, uh, his own rose, like yeah. Arlok Admire, and 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 tragically, the 
roles are, are inverted because mm -hmm. Emeraldas is the one who will lose Tochiro. Yes. And so from here, we have a lull, a decade. And this is the this movie, this series, which was originally supposed to run for uh, 40 plus episodes cut down to 24 or something. Well, 22, yeah. 22, 24. Uh, so, you know, in my opinion, tragically cut down because I would have loved to have seen this story more fleshed out. But we don't get much until a Harlock saga. And yeah, and so basically in the late 80s, uh, Matsumoto, after doing a lot of different stuff, gets back to Harlock and, and, and company and, um, and does something he had on his mind for a long time. And maybe we'll actually talk more about it in another podcast someday. Uh, it's uh, the Ring of the Nibelungen. So mm. it's taking Wagner's opera and doing a version of it with Arlok and company as, a, as main characters. And that's in this manga, uh, which had a very weird and, and interesting publication history. And that's where basically that's, you have established for the first time, like on paper, that Metel and Emeraldas are sisters. That's a turning point when basically Matsumoto makes it canonical. So yeah, they're sisters, that's it. You see them as kids together. Uh, you have another version of Emeraldas finding the Queen Emeraldas. Yeah, a lot of stuff happens. Uh, even if the manga is not, is not great, but uh, you can see that Matsumoto throws a lot of stuff in there that will have an impact on many of his later works. It's a very interesting piece because I don't know if this had been done properly before, obviously before, but we have opera mixed with a space opera. And I don't know if this had been really on the nose done before, a retelling of an opera in a sci-fi setting. I don't, I don't know of any other example. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the anime too, the anime being a bit maligned, um, a bit shunned for being, uh, as Darren put it, ponderous. Very ponderous, yes. Emeraldus. How does Emeraldus fit into the ring cycle in well, the storytelling? One, one thing I think uh, I found very interesting is that she, basically the opening scene of the manga or Arlok saga, the opening chapter, is uh, Arlok and uh, no, not Arlok, it's Emeraldus and Tochiro right. being on an investigation together. Arlok only ap appears a bit later. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, uh, Emeraldas and Tochiro are coming to this asteroid. Something happened. All the population apparently was killed. I love the first episode of the anime. It's very like I, I was hooked when I watched that. I was, this is a mystery. I'm into it, you know. Uh, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, it does not deliver really after that. But, uh, but the early, the first chapter is Emeraldas and Tochiro team up. And, and that's very, the, I think, the first time you actually see that. They are the heroes at that point of the story. They That's the, the fan writing. service I want. Like, yeah, exactly. I was all about that sort of like, yes, these two should be kicking ass all over the universe together. So, but how does that scene fit into the ring cycle? There's not always um, a clear analog. It's not one to one. Yeah, it's. Well, uh, what role would you say she's filling closest then? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's no real equivalent to uh, Emeraldas and Toshiro in, in the ring. I mean, mm. Arlok, he clearly is built as Matsumoto's version of Siegfried, uh, uh, but more of a Siegfried as, as we imagined him, uh, as this. The hero will bring down the gods. The Arcadia, the ship, is uh, Notung, is a sword, the sword that can kill the gods. So Toshiro is a man who, f who forges the sword. I can't remember if this is an, a character with an actual role in the, mm. in the opera, to be honest. But uh, Emeraldas, basically, yeah, she, she does not have a real... Her, her story and metal are, are, are the more... The, the ones that feel like they have the less to do with the actual ring... In, in the manga. Yeah. Because you can make parallels with Arlok and Toshiro avenging their fathers and building the ships that can destroy the gods and going to Valhalla and, 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 and freeing Brunhild like Siegfried did, does in the opera. And, and Brunhild, in, in a way, you can, f you can see that Matsumoto was building up a love between Arlok and Brunhild at some point. 
the, the metal and emerald are, are mostly there, I think, for the fan service in the sure. uh, noble sense of the term. Uh, she, she, they are here because fans expect them to play some role in the story, but they're not really meaningful in the great order of things. In the in the unpublished chapter, the ones that were published on this website but never collected in uh, in the um, Tankobon uh, volume, you have uh, actually Emeraldas having a bit of spotlight because she's fighting Krimild, uh, which is an evil Valkyrie that Wotan sends to kill Arlok. And, and there's an Emeraldas versus Krimild uh, battle. And that's basically where Matsumoto stopped. <laughs> that's okay. He ends his battle and then he, I don't know, he drifted to another story and, and forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. Chad, uh, what are your thoughts on Emeraldus and Harlock Saga? To a degree, I prefer her animation versus the uh, OVA. Okay. You like her character design and, and how yeah. she moves? Uh, yeah. At the same time they're making the Harlock Saga OVA, they decide to do the Queen Emeraldus OVA, which is. Uh, ambitious in its own right. And so this ends up being a, a very loose adaptation of the 1977 manga. Very loose. Um, it's it's very much more sort of villain of, of the day where they're, they're strong villains. They're notable villains. They're well-crafted, well-thought-out villains where some of the villains, issue by issue, yes, they, they exist in the manga, but they're not as strong or interesting they even in the manga sometimes when they could be strong even the, the sirens appear in both the manga and the anime but in the ma uh, in the manga the sirens get a little bit of development and then they're just kind of shot away it's just, everything in the manga seems to go away with a big blast uh but in the anime things are a little bit more methodical um compared to the manga that came out i see it kind of just being like a vessel to try and like put the name out there more often. I mean, you know, they have a lot of the same elements, but I mean, once again, there's a lot of that inking problem where there's just like nothing going on. It's just mm. darkness. Um, I really liked some of the action shots, but unfortunately, like she's very stiff in the way they animate her. Mm. Like she'll do very solitary dodges. She'll like kind of predict where things are going to go seemingly. Yeah. And it looks fluid. And like, if you're in her shoes, but she's also like not really moving, say like Harlock does where he'll do very classic sword fighting techniques where he'll like lunge or roll or yeah. something. I think that that's very interesting you point that out because this is where we have anime catching up to the point technically where we can have Matsumoto style brush strokes in uh, an anime. And this, I believe, is probably one of the first times in that and Eternal Fantasy. But Eternal Fantasy has a movie budget to work with. And yeah. Queen Emeraldus, the OVA, seems to have blown its load in the intro with this, you know, gorgeous for the time 3D animated Queen Emeraldus ship that we have a whole pan through. And it's it's used quite often. But how much did that cost? Could we have gotten a little bit more animation? Like you said, it is it does end up being a bit stiff. It does end up being a bit empty. Like Julian said earlier, they did try to flesh out characters and give more characters there. But yeah, even when we have new characters introduced and entire cities that they exist in, they are very barren. And I still think the, the OVA is actually... The, the first two episodes, which are the only two which were released. Different think, different West. animation studios yeah. between the first and second two episodes, and which is why we didn't we only got the first two, because I believe uh, they had publishers over a barrel with the second two. They knew they could maybe upcharge. I don't have that for fact, but why else wouldn't we have gotten them? They may not have won one of that price or... Um. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I think in the, the other two episodes, uh, episode four and three and four, there's some very almost experimental moments with animation, with the horse, uh, mecha and stuff like that, which look very cool. Even if the, um, the art style, I'm, I'm, I think is a bit different. If I want to introduce someone to the Ladyverse, 
with something that's not too long, that's not like two hours of Galaxy Express 3.9, yeah. that gets, gives them a feeling of what it is. Episode one and two, they work as a complete story. These are cool moments, true. cool music. Uh, the theme song is great. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Stuck in my head as we were beginning and, and, this. And, and that's usually, you know, the two OVAs. I like them as a sort of easy entry point into Lady, the Ladyverse. You're not wrong. You're absolute. That may be, yeah, even more bite-sized than uh, my my personal favorite. I say sit down and watch Bonjour Galaxy Express 3.9. But you have a point there. Somebody can only do it in 40, 45 minutes. So yeah. we have the OVA. Um, which comes out. And then we have Maytel Legend, which is another thing that we just don't have really available in English, but it did come to France. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and it's 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 very, uh, it's not that great. It's a bit weak, honestly. Mm. Uh, but it's it works as a bridge between Queen Millennia and Galaxy Express. It fills the blanks or, or it begins filling these blanks. And and in animation, that's when you you see young Metal and young Emeraldas, and their relationship with their mother, and uh, right. and the beginning of their the uh, galactic royal family properly fleshed out in this unfortunately not so great yeah display. We can breeze over that then into something I find a little bit more interesting. And it seems there are a lot of Lazyverse fans that that do like Cosmo Warrior Zero. You have noted here that we first time we see uh, Totoro and Emeraldus as a as a couple. I, I would say, doesn't that kind of happen in Harlock Saga? Well, in Harlock Saga, you see them walking together, mm -hmm. but this they seem to you know enjoy it's less romantic, make some some jokes and so on. Yeah, uh, but but you don't really see them romantically involved in Cosmo or Zero you have this moment where Emeraldas basically left literally left him hanging <laughs> yes. because he, 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 he looked Being a at a woman yeah. uh, and then at, in the tavern she, he, he, you see him falling asleep on her on, on her legs uh, and then she's very gently uh, uh, put his hat on him and so so you have these moments where you never really saw before when you see them being being in love with each other and being uh, with a lot of affection with each other. Yeah. And there's these bonus episodes they did at the very end of the series, which are mostly j joke episodes. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of uh, very very funny. Uh, Basically, uh, underwear planet with fungus yeah. growing all over it, and, and uh, they meet the guy from Otoko Oidon who's, yeah. who's brewing some some. And yeah, it's a lot of Legiverse jokes. And you see, there's a moment where they're discussing their big plan, and and, and Emeraldas is like folding Tochiro's underwear, <laughs> like a, like a perfect Japanese wife or something. So it's completely um, <laughs> you, you don't believe bonkers. it for one second, but it's it's uh, it's funny to to see. And uh, Chad, what do you think about Emeraldas and Cosmo Warrior Zero? She didn't really get a lot of scenery. Like she had her own. Like, she showed up with a ship. Yeah. And she showed up basically just as like a background character. She had a few moments yeah. of like instigation, but that's she... really the the trio there are background characters in Cosmo Warrior Zero. So yeah, Warius is basically the main character. Yeah. yeah, everyone else is incidental. But she's got a a very she's got a, a character redesign that is exceptional. I think. I mean, it's it's bold. It's all it's as bold as Rintaro's in Space Pirate Captain Harlock anime, but it's better. It almost kind of references it a little bit, but it's better. Yeah, it's a kind of jumpsuit, a red jumpsuit. Uh, it's, it's very cool, and it's visually you see that it's it's supposed to be maybe a younger Emeraldas. Of course, Tochiro is still yeah. alive, so that's all very young at this point. I think Harlock still has his two eyes and so on. Yeah, yep. young Harlock. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, she she does not have uh, like the full on costume. Uh, she she still immediately you see and uh, same from Arlok actually Ooh, has this blue jumpsuit. He looks more like an aviator than than a pirate. One thing that I think from Queen Emeraldas to uh, Galaxy Railways and so on, they they were very very lucky to have um, Keisuke Masunaga uh, as a character designer because the guy does an exceptional job every time. And he also worked on the, on Dai Yamato. And Dai Yamato, 
is was a train wreck for many <laughs> reasons. A bit maligned. Uh, but the the one thing Diamato is doing an exceptional job at is character design. Yeah. All the all the characters in Diamato, you want you want them to be in in a series that do them justice because they look so great. And yeah, he, he did the, all the design on Cosmo Warrior Zero and the Gun Frontier anime as well. Uh, not everything on Galaxy Railways, but a fair share of Galaxy Railways a, as well. And even now, he, he does stuff uh, around the Matsumoto universe. He's, I think he's one of the people Matsumoto trusts with designing yeah. his characters for animation. Yeah, doing an, an excellent job with a varied stroke width, which is not uh, typical in anime. It's com- it's completely bonkers in anime to have varying stroke width. It's it's completely counterintuitive to the entire production process, and I and I love it so much more just for that because the animation is a lot more stiff, like like Chad said, but in the fluidity and the depth that is given through the dynamic brush strokes. You have almost more movement in a still image than you could ever have with a mono width line. It's like it conveys its own movement. Exactly. Yes. So up until our our last point here, Chad and I are are lost, uh, Julia, and it's going to be on you. I noticed we don't have a Space Symphony Maytel listed here, which is just kind of like a follow up to Maytel Legend. So I don't know if you want to mention that at all, but uh, I'm going to have you take us up to our end point. Sp- Space Symphony Metal is a, is an interesting series. Yeah, I think it has a bit more budget than Cosmo Warrior Zero, but it's clearly done by the same team. Okay. Uh, it's the same team having reached the sort of, now they know, they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, they're how doing to use the well. digital tools without it looking stiff and flat. Yeah. And so it, it basically continues from Metal Legend and continues filling up these years be- between uh, Metal Legend and Galaxy Express. Emeraldas, uh, our whole um, arc with Metal is a mirror of the arc of Yayoi and her sister in Queen Millennia, because you see Emeraldas becoming openly a rebel against her mother, distrusting Metal for apparently walking with with a demon, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and uh, and we see actually Promethean. Uh, trying to assassinate Emeraldas at some point, uh, like sending a, 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 an assassin like as if she's coming to make peace and Emeraldas just shoot her in the head. Again. What, do, what do we call this in royalty when, when you know, people are killing each other all the time, you know, kings? Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, this is a little bit of Game of Thrones, but... Uh... Red Wedding. Yeah. <laughs> but but you, you see that, yeah, Emeraldas uh, and her mother are really not being reconciled anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and and Metal goes for a more manipulative way of walking herself into her mother's good grace, but betraying her from inside and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's interesting because it continues fleshing out this Emeralda's role in the Galaxy Express bigger storyline, basically. In Galaxy Express, at the time, uh, Matsumoto is also drawing the manga and continuing this sort of new... Uh, saga of Galaxy Express. Right, he he restarted doing the manga, and him, and there he was writing books before this, right? No, no, no. The books came later. The books came later. Okay, so he so he rebooted the an the the manga, the, he and then the manga in in ninety six. Okay, which was a basis for Eternal Fantasy, mm-hmm. uh, and he continued drawing it until two thousand and three, where he, oh, he stopped, as he usually does. <laughs> uh, but uh, he ended on a on strange moment, basically, for these characters because. You you get a sort of crossover with the Galaxy Railways characters, they meet each other, uh, and uh, and you at the end you have the Galaxy Express One Thousand appearing, like it's coming like for, from the future or something. Plus one, and and it's getting boarded by the Queen Emeraldas because she wants to meet a man who is on that train, and it's very mysterious. And she she meets him, and the guy looks exactly like Tochiro. And he reveals that his name is, is Nobota Oyama. He's Tochiro's son. And Emeraldas asks for proof. And he produces the, the saber of the Oyama clan that we see also in Gun Frontier and so on, San, Santenga Mugen. And she looks at it and she has a tear rolling because she realizes it's truly is Tochiro's son. And she gives him back the saber and she says, like, you have a, a great destiny in this galaxy. And then now I leave you be and... Uh, 
be be your father's son basically she leaves and and you never know like is Toshiro as a son with someone else I mean maybe uh, did, did it happen before he met Emeraldas or after I, we don't know so we a, never ever got closure on that he, he, actually Nobota reappears in the Galaxy Express novels gotcha um, so, so there is some closure to that but Matsumoto never actually drew it. Uh, he, he had it written as novels. And we discover uh, very early in the novels that she actually has a mechanized planet that her mother intended to, to gift to her and that Emeraldas would have none of it. But it still exists. And basically, in, in the novels, Metal is trying to... The machine empire still exists. And she's basically saying, okay, I cannot destroy it. So I will actually reform it uh, in the sense of, I will make them live in peace with mankind and, and we'll find, we'll make it work instead of, of trying. And so basically Emeralda says, there is this planet you could use to make a fresh start with this idea you have. I never wanted it, but take it and make it, make something good with it. So that's how basically it starts. And, and Emerald, of course, reappears later because there's this huge final climatic battle with the metanoids that, that Matsumoto has been building to two worlds for, for two decades almost. Yeah, it's there in the novel and everyone everyone in there, uh, you have the Illumidas, you have the Mazones, you have Arlok, you have Emeraldas, you have, and it's a big, that's a big one that you want to see on the big screen someday. Three decades. 80 to yeah. 20, 2011. So, yeah, that's uh, quite the epic. And I would love to see and hear and read that entire tale uh, spread yeah. out. You can read the summary on Triple Nine. Hey, well, there you that's go. The best well, I can do. Triple Dash Nine dot FR. Uh, big plug for Julian's site. Please go check that out. Uh, you can translate it to many different languages. Uh, and he's an excellent source. I use it for Lazyverse all the time. Chad. Would you be yeah. interested in kind of taking us through this last one? Because I know it's one of your favorites. With her showing up in Dimensional Voyage, it's very brief. Like, I think there are maybe four or five actual installations throughout all the volumes of her showing up. What is the kind of brief synopsis there for us to kind of get familiar with the series? Um, so I'm very unsure about the time frame. It takes place, but Mayu is, I think, about 16 or 17. Tadashi is still like the same age that he's always been. <laughs> so that's weird. Um, let's see. The Mazon are like the primary antagonist, but the Illumidas are on Earth already. And they're kind of like making administration changes on Earth. So, so instead like, of like the lazy government, we have a new the, they've they've got a like invasive force already in them. And then they compound that with the Mazo. Yeah. Interesting. So basically, with Dimensional Voyage, um, Matsumoto, it, it's 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 the same continuity as the Ultimate Journey novels. OK, uh, you can see basically it set up a lot of things from the or, or it's it acts as a. Uh, giving some background on some things you have in the Ultimate Journey novels. And for me, it's like, I call it, you know, um, just like you have Ultimate Spider-Man in comics. <laughs> this is, for me, this is Ultimate Arlock. It's a new version of, of the original Arlock manga, but that takes stuff from all that came after that and, and walks, in, walks it into the narrative. It's a retelling of, of the, the, what they call the Mazon Hand, so the Mazon Saga. Uh, but modernized and also with ties to Galaxy Express to a lot of different things. While you zero appears in it, yeah. Uh, so, so for for me, it's it's great because, yeah, it 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 contributes to this feeling of okay, everything is coming together, and everything I wouldn't say makes sense, but at <laughs> least uh, exists in the same story. Yeah. Yeah. Chad, uh, so so you were going to talk about you said basically five main appearances of Emeraldus here. I mean, with yeah. your recollection of the series, uh, how does she kind of appear and evolve and end up? For a 
short period. It's just like she appears in space. Basically, she just progresses the story saying, this is what happened. This happened here. And so then, she's exp- she's kind of the exposition. exposition. Yeah. yeah. And then next thing you know, Harlock is stuck in like a gravity well. So Queen Emeraldus has to come in, just blow the hell out of the gravity well. And the Arcadia is free, etc. How does she do that? You know what? I'm so regretting this. The in the OVA, the one of the coolest things is that the Queen Emeraldus gets a, like a la- a disjointed laser cannon at the top of it and just kind of starts blasting things with that. I just thought that that was so like Showa and cool. I don't know. What what how does she skull, skull cannon? Yeah, the skull cannon. I mean, does, is that in Dimensional Voyage? No. Oh, um, okay. It's basically just like, oh, you see it lock on to this thing. And then all of a sudden, just like, you know, it gets hit with a massive laser. Okay. Um, but that's one thing I wanted to hit on was in the OVAs, it like shows the Queen Emeraldus having tons of firepower. Yeah. Like it is utterly devastating to like entire fleets by itself. It doesn't take long to just kill everything. Like, <laughs> not trying to downplay it, but even the Arcadia doesn't have that kind of upward possibility. Yeah. I mean, the Arcadia has tons of other abilities, but Jesus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's really like it fires in all directions simultaneously. So, I mean, uh, it, it does feel a bit in the OVA, like uh, there's no strategy to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Just it, press a button, obliterate everything. <laughs> so, so Emeraldus is blowing up things, gravity wells, and uh, is that is that her climax there in the series, or does she resolve anyway? That was kind of the climax, and then you basically see her getting. What was it? They go to Toshiro's grave. Harlock, Mayu, and. Emeralda shows up and it's kind of like the last hurrah. Everyone has like a drink, at the tavern, you know, that type of thing. And Harlock kind of like has an ultimatum with Lafrigia actually in that tavern. And everyone's given it a stink eye. And <laughs> who invited her? Like, who let her in the here? Yeah, that's an interesting exactly. meetup. Yeah. Um, but there's like a sort of like an ethos with the Harlock at that point. It's, you need to be able to like have your enemy right in front of you before you can actually confront them on a personal level. Yeah. And then, yeah, they have their drink and they split ways. What would you say of Emeraldus's character in this? I mean, how would you describe her? To be honest, just the same as it was yeah. in Galaxy Express. She's just, like you said, exposition. She shows up, does a short bit of action, then leaves. Seems to be her MO when it comes to being in the Liege verse with everyone else. Julian? It's, it's Unless it's her own bit. Right, right. It's still interesting that, I mean, we know Matsumoto was not a big fan of Mayu as a little girls, a little girls that Arlok has to save. So it's interesting that he brings her back as a teenager and he actually shows her interacting with our mother and, and they actually have a very sweet mother daughter moment at to- Toshiro's tomb when they, they hug. <laughs> I mean, you can yeah. imagine. And I, I, it was nice because it was really felt like a moment that was 40 years coming <laughs> you know, <laughs> that Emeraldas uh, shows that she loves her, her daughter. And we don't know in this version exactly why Emeraldas left, but I think it's hinted that she probably left when Mayu was older and, and, and more capable of taking care of herself. And when they meet each other, it's like, you don't see like Mayu being like, you abandoned me, mom. It's more like, oh, mom, I'm so happy to see you. And, and they embrace. And so it's, it's really heartwarming <laughs> for yeah. a long time uh, Matsumoto reader to have this moment. I feel like, ah, Emeraldas is a good mom, actually. <laughs> Yeah, sort of uh, maybe even Matsumoto himself and uh, through Chimaboshi, uh, the artist, uh, working together to kind of finally formally bring her into the family, so to speak, as a, as a relevant character and not so maligned by the master. But uh, there is an appearance of Emeraldus in Memoirs de la Arcadia by Jerome Alquier. 
um, this is not available to us and won't be available to us in uh, the current volume that's being made, I believe. It's a volume two appearance that uh, I don't know anything about. Jerome, uh, any, any note on that? I think that would be our final point, if anything, here. Since I, I guess it will come in English at some point. It will, yeah. Uh, with... I, I, I don't want to spoil things, but sure. uh, I, I was really pleasantly surprised uh, with uh, Jérôme Alquier's work on Memories of the Arcadia, Arcadia because uh, in the first volume, when it came out, it was it looked gorgeous, but it felt like, okay, it's, it's, an, it's a Captain Harlock episode, basically. But in volume two and then volume three, it really, like goes beyond that and 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 goes into some emotional stuff and i really at the end of the story i, I really like who who's cutting onions there uh and um yeah. and, and there's so, some yeah. mayu there too right i mean yeah yeah and it, it, it's interesting because it's it, it touches on some of the same themes as, as dimensional voyage but in a different way yeah i don't want to spoil uh what, what happened could, could you give us even just a very broad like impression that you had of Emeraldus in these works just a very broad impression well she she's really it's a very minor uh appearance so so very similar to what we've had before but it's you, you can see it's been written in a way to address some inconsistencies that you could have in the old tv series with uh, a relationship with Toshiro and stuff like that, and it incorporates some some of the more recent stuff to make her more in line with what we know of of Emeraldas. It's more the Emeraldas we know and love. So what uh, we were kind of like lamenting in Space Pirate Captain Harlock, the anime, and where how she's presented there, we get a little bit of a retcon that uh, yeah, uh, it's retcon a little better. And, but you you see that it's a retcon that ca that comes from a place of love. Yeah, oh. and and with retcons in the Luigi verse, it's all another spin on the on the Ring of Time. Absolutely. So it's it's not the same thing. Any closing words, uh, Chad, on on Emeraldus? What what are your impressions of the character through time? Have you appreciated its evolution? Maybe not liked its evolution more. What are your thoughts? As far as representation, I really prefer her in the OVAs because she's shown as being a lot more wizened to mm -hmm. the way things work in the universe. As far as her connections, I prefer her in Dimensional Voyage because there's all these assorted like tips of hats to everyone. Like as soon as anyone shows up, it's like, yo, there's Warrior Zero. Uh, there's Diver Zero. He shows up. It's just like, I like having that joint effort across like all these big figureheads as far as action and capability once again i st i still prefer the ova because you know even though she's very blocky in her animation style like she does she gets ambushed and puts two bullets in two separate people's hearts does like a roll lunge and puts another one point blank through a guy's chest it's like <laughs> That was less than three seconds. That's impressive. And, and you were asking me, you know, is the is the Cosmo John Dragoon Wick. John Wick level of John yeah. Wick. badass dumb? And, <laughs> and you were saying, you know, on, in the OVA, he she shoots a man, and he like, and the fabric of the universe is shown through like the power of the Cosmo Dragoon. And, and you were asking me, is this is this just what the Cosmo Dragoon can do? And it's like, well. The dragoon does a lot. It can like re like fix the earth in in friggin' uh, endless odyssey. So, so <laughs> you know it can do a lot of stuff. Julian, what are your final thoughts here on Emeraldus? Emeraldus is one of my favorite characters of the of the Legiverse, uh, and I I always hoped that she would get more spotlight, basically, and and I, as you said, that she would get her own TV series. Uh, she deserves one. And I was super excited when a couple of years ago, uh, Gainax announced that they were doing a trilogy of movies. And the she first was, one yeah. was supposed to be Emeraldas. Zero movie. century. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and this turned out to be a, a... Maybe a farce. It did not work out. Yeah. And I don't know exactly why, but it's, uh, it did not happen. And it's uh, really a waste because I was really, really excited for this. So, But I fingers crossed that someday... 
Emeraldas gets the spotlight she deserves. The the workings there are are you know they still exist. Uh, whatever Gynax did before their uh, bankruptcy issues, I believe, and legal problems and this and that. Uh, Zero century is something we in the lazy verse lament. Uh, and I would just say, Emeraldas, uh, I agree with with both of you. The OVA is absolutely fantastic. She's a great piece of representation uh, as a character, a strong female character, which we were robbed of that anime. She had her perfect time to move in and the 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 wrong calls were made, in my my opinion. Um, Emeraldus is a mysterious beauty with strength, and that uh, unlike Maytel, doesn't leave you irritated afterwards with potential misgivings, or you know the the Shinonora character, or or even maybe the Yuki number seven character sort of splits in two. It seems, and we have this you know f- there's a female warrior side, and there's a sultry sort of manipulative side and they finally kind of split off and I, I love that strong warrior side the loyal side and and Totoro is my favorite so I'm of course gonna be all for his favorite lady I appreciate you so much Julian for sticking with us all this time anything you'd like to plug as usual I can plug my uh, absolutely my, my, my role-playing game lore and legacy it's a science fantasy game uh, it takes place on it's like planet opera kind of thing uh, uh, like you know, John Carter, uh, Jack Vance, uh, technology meets fantasy, basically, and uh, and it's now available in English. I don't think it was a case last time we we spoke. It's awesome. So yeah, there's an English version of the core book. Uh, yeah. So if you're on YouTube, I will put that in the description below. Go check out that link and pick up Lauren Legacy. Uh, Chad, anything you'd like to plug here at the end? Let's see, uh, just the usual. I mean, I got my Facebook meme page, uh, you know, Captain Harlock in the Arcadia. Um, other than that, you can catch me on Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. Uh, we've got some crazy stuff happening over there. Um, we've got up to 227 Ooh. episodes. Oh, boy. Excellent. We're on four here. We'll get there someday. Of course, check out facebook.com slash Liegeverse, the world's largest English-speaking fan site for Liege Matsumoto. That's my deal. And if you want, check out Captain Hardluck, which is what I go by, and I do the raps about uh, the Liegeverse, the world's only retro anime, only rapper dedicated to a singular person. I went niche tard. Uh, that's it. That's all. Hardluck salute. Out. Big love. Have a good one. Bye-bye.